Um, so, VAX, the Visiting Artist and Criti Critics Series, was founded in 2011 as a collaborative program of GOCA and the visual art and art history programs of the VAPA department. Over the past decade, this series was co-produced by GOCA and UCCS visual art and art history programs, and we have invited artists and scholars to the campus to present public lectures and meet with undergraduate students in classes and workshop settings. So tonight, I would like to begin our introductions by acknowledging our sponsors, without whom we cannot do any of this programming. So thank you to Colorado Creative Industries, the City of Colorado Springs, Visit Colorado Springs, LART, which is the Lodging and Auto Rental Tax, and the B. Vradenberg Foundation. Pleasure in protest to the exhibition that is on view opening tomorrow evening in conjunction with this lecture was curated by Dr. Sarah Jane Parsons and organized by the art galleries at TCU in Fort Worth, Texas, with assistance from the Inman Gallery in Houston and Soco Gallery in Charlotte, North Carolina. The wallpaper in the exhibition was designed by Jackie Gendel and provided by Peg Norris and Schumacher and Company. The exhibition is sponsored in part by a grant from the UCCS Faculty Assembly Women's Committee. I would also like to thank the UCCS Visual and Performing Arts Department and our UCCS Student Government Association. And finally, a special thank you to GOKA's advisory board members and donor circle members. Thank you all so much for your generous support that makes these vital programs possible. And now, I would like to welcome my incredible colleague, Lene Bowman Cravens, um, to introduce our speaker this evening and the one solely responsible for bringing this exhibition and our speaker to UCCS. So welcome, Lene. Hi. Um, before I introduce Dr. Sarah Jane Parsons, I want to acknowledge and thank the amazing team that helped put this exhibition together. Um, Dr. Joy Armstrong, who is GOKA's new director, who you just met, and is awesome. Um, Abiel Kopetsky, who is GOKA's former gallery manager. Um, our, the gallery team at Texas Christian University. Brian Veal for his skills with installing Jackie's wallpaper. And our wonderful GOKA student staff, who we can't do anything we do without them. Woo. <laughs> Um, everyone worked really hard over the last few months to get Pleasure and Protest ready to share with our community here in Colorado Springs, and I'm so proud of the work that everyone's done to make this show a reality. So please join us for the opening tomorrow if you have some time and want to chat with the guest curator. Um, so tonight's lecture is by guest curator Dr. Sarah Jane Parsons. Parsons is the director and curator of the art galleries at TCU in, Forth, in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, she promotes the professional development of students' vision of TCU satellite space free and drives international curation, curatorial vision of TCU satellite space, Fort Worth Contemporary Arts. Her curatorial practice is informed by working in close collaboration with artists to produce new artworks through commissions, exhibitions, and artist residencies. Parsons was previously the exhibitions curator at Blue Coat in Liverpool, UK, uh, producing a diverse contemporary exhibition program from 2006 to 2014. She worked directly with many artists to develop exhibitions and produce new and often on-site-specific works, including Jill Bradley, Gina Kar Karnetsky, uh, Hugh Locke, and Emily Speed. During her time in Liverpool, she was also a collaborative member of several curatorial teams working across the city, including the Liverpool Biennial, Look, which is Liverpool's Biennial International Photography Festival, and the Liverpool Arab Arts Festival. Parsons' critical writing has been published in contemporary art magazines, including Exposure, Source, and Art Monthly Australia. She has also published essays in various exhibition catalogs. Um, Parsons received her PhD from the University of Plymouth in the UK last year in 2023. Her thesis is entitled An Accumulation of Care, Affect and the Role of Contemporary Curator. Um, so this, like Joy said, this exhibition is in conjunction with Pleasure and Protest, which opens tomorrow, January 25th, and is on view through March 16th. So please join us either tomorrow or sometime over the next month and a half and see this wonderful exhibition. Um, but please help me welcome Dr. Sarah Jane Persons. Good evening. 
Hi, good. <laughs> Hi, my old lady glasses on, but I can still see you. Um, thank you so much to Joy and Lene and the rest of um, GOKA, the Ent Center team, for inviting me here to speak with you this evening. I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm so excited that we're opening our exhibition tomorrow, Pleasure and Protest. It includes the work of five uh, amazing artists, very dynamic, and the work is very vibrant, so I think you're going to um, enjoy it. I'd like to give a special shout out to the GOKA team of students, the technicians that have installed the show up here. Thank you so much. <laughs> <clears throat> It looks wonderful, um, so thank you. I really appreciate that. And while I've been here this week and previously to set up the exhibition, everybody has been so welcoming and so kind, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, so this evening, I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes, somewhere in there, <laughs> setting my timer so I don't implode. Um, and then we're gonna have a little bit of time for Q&A, um, and so that'll be kind of at the end of my talk. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about care and the role of the curator in contemporary art. And I've worked as a curator since 1997, and I'll admit that my professional approach has changed over the years, but it's really developed in a responsive way, as a flexible and organic response to the experiences um, that I've had working with different artists and making different exhibitions, but also I think probably a curiosity that is something that always drives my work. I'm always asking questions. Why did you make it like that? How big is that? Hmm, you know, there's always something that I'm sort of thinking about. Um, in my career, I've organized over 100 public exhibitions to date, and mostly trying to find answers to some of those questions, those theoretical propositions, those questions of the context around artistic production, or sometimes in response to institutional initiatives, as you'll see from some of the projects I'll talk about this evening. Now, significantly, all of the exhibitions that I've worked on have been produced in a Kunsthall context, and that German word simply means it's an exhibition venue that features temporary exhibitions. It does not hold uh, a collection. And I've really focused on commissioning new work with artists. And so I'm liberated from more traditional curatorial uh, preoccupations that involve the care of a collection. So over the years, uh, each opportunity has brought a new set of challenges to my practice. Um, and my curatorial practice has changed as a result. And I've come to understand this process as a process of um, accumulation, an accumulation of care. And I refer to my practice as a web of care, as you see um, indicated here. And essentially, this is a weaving together of a variety of roles and responsibilities that I take on as a curator. So this evening, I'd like to share with you a range of projects that really illustrate aspects of my expanded curatorial practice as a way of working that goes beyond stewardship solely of artworks and rather to encompass engagement, empathy, and allyship with people. The word curator comes from the Latin word cura, meaning to take care. And so I thought it would be useful to begin my lecture uh, really with a consideration very briefly of the history of the profession. Uh, in the 17th and 18th century of Europe, uh, a curator was someone who was employed by a collector. They were known as a keeper, essentially somebody that had a big bunch of keys and could lock up the artwork in storage and keep it safe. And they were largely responsible for shipping, uh, cataloging artwork. Um, and this was a time before commercial galleries, so the curator also advised the collector on their investments, and they also coordinated with art dealers. But by the 19th century, as public museums became popular, the curator also began to take on pedagogical concerns in arranging and displaying artworks for exhibition. Now, historically, curators had come from a scholarly background, uh, practiced in research and writing, but actually there was no actual professional or academic training uh, for the curator. This didn't develop until really the end of the 20th century. So in the 1990s, we start to see graduate programs that appear in curating. 
And I was a little bit behind the cusp, so I was not able to participate in those programs. And so I actually learned on the job. I've learned from other curators. I've been mentored by arts professionals. And I've also done uh, a lot of trial and error. So I'm not going to talk about my mistakes this evening. But just suffice to say that I learned on the job, and I learned a lot. Um, so I feel like the new uh, graduate programs in curating um, are really kind of responsive. They've responded to the ways artists make art, particularly in the last few decades around conceptual art. And these courses really illuminate new and diverse, diverse paths to being a curator. So you can now curate a film program, a music festival, or a performance, not just an exhibition. And while the profession still largely encompasses traditional roles of the care for artworks, the processes and expectations involved in contemporary exhibition making have now become much more complex in recent decades. Additional responsibilities are regularly assumed within the role that reflect an expansion of care beyond the physical and intellectual concern of objects. The shift, this shift considers that the interests and methods of artists um, should be considered as well as ways to engage audiences more effectively. So for example, curators are now exploring alternative models of exhibition making. They're also involved in processes for critiquing institutions and funding streams. They're also drawing attention to inequity within the profession and promoting social justice through art. Interestingly, in parallel to the development of curatorial practice in the last several decades, some scholars have begun to speculatively explore long-used definitions of care. And this is one of my favorite books to read on the subject. Uh, this is by Maria Puy de Bella Casa, and this is from 2017, her book, Matters of Care. In this book, there's a really great chapter uh, about care of objects, and she posits the idea that just thinking about care, being more aware of what care is, has the potential to make visible neglected activities. Hmm. This is something I think about a lot, <laughs> because really the details of curatorial, curatorial practice are often obscured and invisible. So I think it's important here tonight with the possibility that potentially there are some emerging curators in the audience, um, I think it's important to really try and make transparent what curators do. Nobody ever told me. I had to kind of figure this out for myself. So I really want to pass this on to you. Uh, because I think a lot of the care work of contemporary curators is essentially invisible labor. You see exhibitions that they have created with artists, but the means by which those exhibitions are curated are really unseen. Aspects of care in the curator's day-to-day -day activities are concealed. Because of this, the profession may seem impenetrable or inaccessible to some people, and I really want to open that up. So I'm committed to revealing care in the curatorial process. And so in response to this question, so what do curators of a contemporary art actually do? <laughs> Well, we nurture relationships with artists, help them develop some of their ideas and proposals for exhibitions uh, or creative projects or perhaps commissions. We also research uh, and develop critical thinking around that work, and sometimes that involves studio visits with artists or travel to see other exhibitions or explore archives. We also have to do a lot of writing, uh, either for exhibition materials, for fundraising, that's always the least fun, <laughs> and promotional materials. We get to wear our project manager hat. We have logistics for the care of objects we have to think about, but also the care of artists and the care of audiences. Networking, advocacy, and fundraising for artists, exhibitions, and ideas. We manage expectations. And that's one of the trickier parts of a curator's job. But particularly if you're working with money, if you have a budget, you want to make sure everybody gets paid, everybody gets paid on time. So you're in charge of that. And then when you finish your project, at the end of it, you have to feed back. You feed back to your funders, your stakeholders, your colleagues, your artists. So evaluation and feedback is really important. And I've found through the years that that's really helped me grow. It's given me the confidence to take risks when I know I can rely on information or people along the way. 
And then just some very boring details. Key administrative tasks. You really need to have clear communication, someone that has attention to detail. There's a lot of documentation and record keeping that goes on um, in terms of making exhibitions. You have to be good at art handling. You have to see problems ahead of time before they happen or something breaks. You might have to be involved in exhibition design and you certainly are involved in any kind of development of promotional and educational materials. So for any of you young um, artists, art historians, potential curators out there who are interested in becoming a curator, make that little checklist and think about those are some of the things that you'll need to think about developing those skills uh, in your own practice. Okay, so from this very practical position, considering the context of care and curatorial practice, I'm now going to spend the rest of my talk talking about my work in two very different art venues. Now, hopefully, this will really illuminate the diverging roles of a curator when working with contemporary artists. And thank you to Lene for the introduction and telling you a little bit about some of the things that I've done and that I've been involved in. But I'm going to transport you to Liverpool. And this is in 2006, I began working at the Blue Coat in Liverpool as the exhibition's curator. And you can see just from this image, it's a beautiful 300-year-old building. It was built in 1717. But it's actually now the home um, of an interdisciplinary art center, as well as visual art, music, dance, spoken word, literature, and performance are also part of the arts program at the Blue Coat. Not only that, there are retail units that sell creative goods, and there's also a community of artists. You can rent, I think now they have around seven or eight artist studios. So there's artists in the building, uh, living, breathing artists in the building making work um, each day. So it's a really interesting um, ecology to work in a building like that. It's actually the oldest um, art center in the UK. Uh, when it was originally built in 1717, it was built as a charitable school by the wealthy merchants of Liverpool. Now we don't have wealthy merchants. <laughs> Instead, it's a publicly funded organization. It's one of the national portfolio organizations of the Arts Council England. Um, but it also relies on the mixed economy of the building. So the rental money from studios, from the retail units, there's also a restaurant. Um, box office ticket money from events, uh, all kinds of things like that also kind of make up part of our funding. Blue Coat is located in the heart of the city centre and the city of Liverpool hosts a really vibrant music and visual arts culture. It's a port city with an imperial history. Uh, it's historically been a place of contradictions, of great wealth, certainly, but it also has some of the poorest neighborhoods in Europe. It's an incredibly rich, has an incredibly rich and complicated history. Um, it's a city of 500,000 people, but 90 languages are spoken. So it really is, there's an international um, culture within the city uh, that's interesting to respond to for a curator. From the image on the right that you see, the lower right, that's the river waterfront of Liverpool, and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Obviously the home of the Beatles. I'm sure there's a few Beatles fans out there tonight. My favorite, Liverpool Football Club, uh, go the Reds. And then in terms of contemporary art, Tate Liverpool uh, has played a really huge role in the regeneration of the city, not just in the arts culture, but more broadly, um, bringing people together for specific events and activities, and it's been doing that since the 1980s. So just to give you a little context of where the Blue Coat sits and the type of city it sits within. When I was there, I was responsible for programming the four gallery spaces at the Blue Coat. And the image you see here is a shot of one of the main spaces. In total, there was about 4,000 square feet of these four galleries. I was also responsible for creating interventions in public areas, both in and outside the building, and also hosting artist residencies. Now, when I joined the building, uh, when, when I joined the organization, the building was actually undergoing refurbishment. It received a large grant um, from the European Union. And there was actually a section of the building which had been bombed during World War II, and it had never been rebuilt. 
And the architects in charge of the refurbishment of the blue coat decided to rebuild that wing. And lucky for me, it would be four brand new galleries as well as a performance space. So the idea that the building under refurbishment was really being reimagined for 21st century audiences. The art team, our remit, was to welcome back our loyal audiences when we reopened, but it was also to encourage new visitors, particularly students, there are three universities in the city, um, and then also a lot of international tourists. So we wanted to, when the building reopened, bring them into the fold, as it were. The building reopened in 2008, and that was the same year that Liverpool celebrated its status as the European City of Culture. And our first exhibition, Now Then, uh, featured the work of five artists. All the works were commissioned. And that was really my project when I started at the Blue Coat. They were artists who had been invited by our artistic director. Um, and they were tasked with the idea of exploring the Blue Coat's past, but also imagining its future. And so when I got to the Blue Coat, my first job was to project manage this really huge exhibition. Um, and bring these commissions into reality. And I'm just gonna share with you a few of those examples so you can kind of get a feel for what that show was like. Um, this is the work of the Scottish artist, Alec Finlay. He created Specimen Colony, uh, which was a series of unique and functioning bird boxes that were installed in the blue coat trees at the front of the building and also in our wonderful courtyard garden. He also created a set of prints and a series of poems that were part of this project. Now the designs on the boxes are based on colorful birds that were depicted on international postage stamps from the British Commonwealth. So you can imagine, and here if you look um, top right, you'll see some of the bird boxes there in the garden. Um, obviously thinking about birds migrating, returning, nesting. These were all ideas that we wanted to um, you know, welcome our audiences with, our people audiences, not our, just our bird audiences. Um, and Alec was a very uh, generous, um, a very generous artist in making this project and really understood where his work was fitting in with some of the ideas we had of engaging with Bluecoat's future. We also commissioned Hugh Locke, uh, he's a London-based artist and this fantastic drawing, this is a wall drawing called Sin Eater. It's actually made of very thin black cord, almost kind of like electrical cord, but it's fibrous, and plastic beads that he bought on Brixton Market in London. Very fancy materials that he was using, of course. Uh, what you see here is based on a her heraldic figure. It's a heraldic figure of Neptune, who's the sea god who dominates Liverpool's coat of arms. And Neptune is seen here standing on the backs of two liver birds who are also symbols of the city of Liverpool. And he's actually urinating onto the head of the devil. Um, pardon me. Locke presented this piece to us, this idea to us, and I'll never forget it actually. He sent me, I kept calling him and asking for a drawing of what he was gonna do. And he didn't really do email. He's like, oh, Sarah, I'll send you a fax. I was like, okay. Nobody uses faxes, even in 2008. He sent me a fax of this drawing, and I still have it somewhere. Um, but essentially, how he described this piece, uh, which was about 20 feet tall. It really goes up the height of uh, gallery, gallery 4. He described this piece as uh, it would cleanse or it would eat the sins of the Blue Coats past. And he was really acknowledging the city merchants who had, through their wealth that was created through the transatlantic slave trade, they had created this wonderful building, but he really wanted to address this and make sure that we were understanding the past if we were going to move forward into the present. Another artist who really was rooted in Blue Coat's past, but was very much about its future, was Yoko Ono. Uh, has a very close relationship with, Lever with Liverpool still today, obviously the home of John Lennon. Uh, she still supports several schools and arts organizations in the city, including the Blue Coat. Now her connection to the Blue Coat was such that her first conceptual art performance in the UK was at the Blue Coat. It was the first one where she actually got paid. Not the first one, but it's the first one where she remembers getting a check from the Blue Coat. 
Um, and lots of people apparently showed up at this event because they thought John Lennon was going to be there, and he didn't. Instead, they had to meet this diminutive Japanese lady, and they weren't quite sure what performance art was all about. So it was all a bit interesting, I think. So she did some of her now famous um, aspects and activities of performance, from sweeping, cutting paper, um, and a lot of squealing, I think we might say today. Um, I love her work immensely, and I always uh, felt quite emotional walking through this area of the what was then the performance space that eventually became our restaurant, knowing that we were walking in this place where Yoko Ono had done this performance. So we invited her back to the Blue Coat some 40 years later, and she created a conceptual installation that you can see behind her here, and it was very important to her that she create something that audiences were invited to participate in, um, not only the action of being involved, but also to imagine the possibilities for the future of the blue coat. So before entering the magical space, Yoko Ono requested that you put on a blob, and you can see that's what these colored shroud-like semi-transparent um, material type things, <laughs> like neck curtains. Uh, when you were suitably blobbed up, you then passed through the empty mirror frame, and when you reached the other side, you would then sit on the magic carpet, which is this blue, um, uh, this blue panel here. You were invited to sit there and contemplate on the future of the blue coat. Now, I was a little skeptical of this installation to begin with, but Liverpool audiences famously <laughs> um, like to get involved, like to tell you they're getting involved, and they got involved, <laughs> and let us know that they were really, um, this, this project was really well received, it was described by visitors as being very empowering because they were being invited by Yoko Ono to be part of making the future of the blue coat. One of the key repeat exhibitions we presented at the Blue Coat was Liverpool Biennial. Uh, this exhibition is the UK's largest biennial exhibition of contemporary art. Uh, I worked within a collaborative group of local curators from all the arts venues across the city. Uh, sometimes when we had meetings, there were 10 or 15 people around a table, all curators. It was like a witch's coven. It was fantastic. It was sometimes difficult. Um, but it was very international in focus. And the biennial was, is dedicated to a different theme each time it's offered. And it involves a lot of commissioned works where artists are brought to the city and they're contracted to make a new work that responds to maybe a site or a venue or perhaps a local narrative. In 2010, the theme of the biennial was touched. And each venue interpreted the theme differently, uh, oftentimes trying to play to the strengths of their own institution. So the Blue Coats artistic director and I began to interpret the theme through our reading and research, and we started asking each other a set of questions. How are humans touched by seeing or making art? How does a moving experience stay with you? As an organization that created exhibitions, but also supported a community of artists in our studios, we asked, how important is evidence of the hand of the maker in this process? We began to think about artists who employed strategies that revolved around the trace of memory and matter, identity and humor, and always a little bit of play. Considering the hand of the maker was very important to us, we thought a lot about materials and the connections between contemporary art practices and traditions and craft. So that was the beginning of our understanding of an interpretation of the theme that worked for what was happening at the Blue Coat and who our audiences were. And I'm going to share just a couple of projects with you um, to illustrate this. Um, the first project is by South African artist Nicholas Lobo. It was called Ndize, and it's a sculptural installation that actually spans two galleries, a downstairs and an upstairs gallery space. Um, Ndize is essentially in Hosa language, which was um, Nicholas's own language, means hide and seek. It's a game of hide and seek. And so the character that you see here is, he's the counter, he's the seeker, he's counting to 100. Lobo creates sculptural installations that really explore and reflect his Hosa heritage, but also sexual identity and personal politics. He contemplates his position as a gay man within the traditional Hosa culture in post-apartheid South Africa. You might imagine this is not an easy proposition. Being gay in South Africa was a criminal offense right up until 1998. 
Plobo's investigation of the past and the present uh, was a way for him to reinvent and recycle objects. His materials often include leather, rubber, ribbon, furniture, other domestic found objects. And now he also creates performances as part of his installation. So this particular project came about when he did a site visit to Liverpool. He was, he was invited to Liverpool by the uh, curator of the Liverpool Biennial, Lorenzo Fusi, and he, he brought Nicholas to uh, the Blue Coat. We looked at the spaces together to see if there was anything that sort of spoke to him and he was thinking about what his installation might be. And I just made a very informal comment about a rather prosaic problem the Blue Coat had. And that was essentially that for all three galleries on the lower level, um, audiences were fine visiting those spaces, but only 75% of them would actually go upstairs to our fourth gallery. There was an elevator, there were stairs, but people just never went upstairs, and we had some fabulous projects up there. So we were always complaining about that. Well, he came to see this as a challenge and actually came back to me with a really delightful and playful proposal that would connect the two galleries with a trail of rubber fabric and clay balls. So in this sense, my duty of care to the artist was as a purveyor of institutional information. I kind of let him in on some of our little secrets or grumbles, and here he is, an artist who's trying to find a solution for something um, that sort of simple and everyday. So here we see the back of uh, Dizay, the the hide-and-seek character, the one who is seeking. So Lobo introduces us to him in the ground floor gallery. He's this lone figure leaning against the window. He's peering out. So audiences, pedestrians passing by are immediately engaged. They want to look in and see who that person is. Uh, but he's also sort of suggestively presenting his rear, silently counting before the search begins. And then from behind him, across the gallery, there's a playful trail that develops, and it's full of these uh, rubber and ribbon and clay objects that eventually end up into this sort of rubber snake that then winds its way out of that gallery where the seeker is, where Adize is, turns the corner, see our lovely signage there that never worked, but an artist always has a great idea to make things work, always had a great solution, and so then you would follow this trail, the idea you would follow it upstairs, and when you got to gallery four upstairs after this mysterious kind of wayfinding exercise, you walked into the gallery and you were confronted with this ribbon room. Uh, and it's really a sensuous maze of brightly colored, densely woven ribbons that, that hung from a great height to the floor. And so it was quite a shock to go from quite this open space downtown, uh, downstairs, and then you follow the trail upstairs, and immediately you're in this uh, really different environment. So at this point, uh, seekers in the game, the audience, you could play the game, and you could walk through, and you could follow different paths. And some path would take you to a window. Some paths would take you just to an empty area. But if you kept looking long enough, you found you found the couple. You found within this labyrinth, this delicious intimacy and mystery, you eventually found the secret lovers who were hidden from view upstairs. So this game of hide and seek also kind of emitted a little bit of sexual tension, and this was obviously something that Nicholas Lobo was exploring. Significantly, this was one of the only pieces in the entire Liverpool Biennial that year that you could actually touch. And the theme was touched, and we thought, yeah, you should be able to touch it. And it worked. Our audiences loved it, and actually, just this part of the exhibition, we had over 40,000 visitors um, to this particular installation. A second project, just to tell you a little bit about, uh, also from the 2010 Liverpool Biennial, was by New York-based Bulgarian artist Daniel Bochkov. It's a project that eventually became known as Music Not Good for Pigeons. Um, <laughs> Daniel subscribes to a practice based in relational aesthetics, and the process of collaboration to produce his biennial project was an incredibly rich experience for me, and it really stands out as, I'm not sure that I'll ever do a project like that quite again, but we'll see. Maybe I'll. Uh, he, Daniel Boschkov made an initial site visit to the Blue Coat in early 2010, 
And his way of making site-specific installations and performances really involves a great deal of research and engagement, not just with the venue that he's working with, so not just with Blue Coat, but also more broadly with the city to try and untangle ideas and think about effective encounters as he's traversing the landscape. And actually, before arriving in 2010, he actually knew the city of Liverpool. He knew it was the home of the Beatles, a historic port, and a place that had stood up to the conservative policies of the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. But he had been a merchant seaman, and he had sailed from Eastern Europe through the Mediterranean, and he stopped in Liverpool. This is in 1986. He stopped in Liverpool, and he was given seven hours of shore leave. And he remembers that seven hours really distinctly, even all these decades later. So for him to come back in 2010, it was a way for him to investigate some of the discrepancies between the past and the present that had happened in his own memory. He wanted to think how he had been touched by the city, and he wanted to essentially trace the affect of his visit before and kind of map and understand the city in some ways. Now, as some initial ideas fell by the wayside, his, um, he began to get a clearer idea of his commission. And you can see this is one of the earlier um, drawings that he sent me. It's actually a recreation of Liverpool Football Club's dressing room, but the home team and the visitor team. But you'll see that ac this actually changes in the final installation. The idea that then stuck and became the final um, piece was after my husband and I took him to a game at Liverpool Football Club at Anfield, because of course, I keep saying, we're fans. And we took him to the home terraces, the home fans' terraces, known as the COP. And it was such an uplifting experience. A lot of singing, it was very boisterous. There was a lot of energy, there was a lot of tension. And there was something really palpable about that experience. And Daniel Bodzkoff really, um, thought about this a lot and said, hey, I want to go back there and do a st stadium tour. I was, okay. So that was part of my job, to give him a stadium tour. So we went back, he toured the team dressing room, and he was actually really struck by its humble simplicity. After, you know, a couple of nights before, he'd been watching these million-pound players playing this game of football, soccer, um, and so he was really surprised when he learned what their dressing room was like. So he started to think of the dressing room as a place of affect and transformation. And essentially his idea was to replicate this space in the gallery. Not only that, it was going to house an affective moment. It was going to house a music video that he made with local musicians and performers. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. So you can see this is the back of Daniel, <laughs> has this wonderful braid that he's had for years. And you can see, it's a very simple, in fact, he said it was so simple, it was like a high school locker room in the United States. It was just very basic. He couldn't understand there were no foot spas or you know, uh, fancy equipment or things like that, but it was a very humble place. And there was sort of a history to that place that he was trying to tap into. So he said he wanted to build a replica of it. So these are two of my tech team, uh, Barry and Tom. And I said, you're not going to believe this, but your task today is to go to Liverpool Football Club and measure up the dressing room, because we're going to make an exact replica of it as best we can, and all the equipment and all the decor of that interior. They thought I was joking, but we were not. <laughs> And here I wanted to show you something unseen. <laughs> this is you know, part of what happened next. Barry and Tom go back and they work with the tech team and we start to create this replica of uh, the dressing room. At this point, Bochkov has returned to the United States and so in his absence, my role as a curator was really to manage the tech team, to manage the production schedule, and at that point, our relationship really relied on a great deal of trust. There were a lot of phone calls. There was a lot of email. We were staying in touch. And I was very responsible for managing this artist's ideas as well as his work. And the final piece you see here, music, not good for pigeons. It was in our largest gallery on the ground floor. And essentially, um, the exterior of the dressing room was a structure made from this metal screen, a type that was used to protect the many vacant properties around the Anfield Stadium. And this part of, of Liverpool, there's whole streets 
that are awaiting demolition as part of Liverpool's redevelopment and regeneration. So he wanted to reference that in a very specific way next to this um, really auspicious stadium. So for the viewer, for the audience, once you stepped into the gallery space, it was very dark, but you could see these lights shining out. So you were kind of enticed into the space. And once you got inside, you saw the replication of the dressing room. You also saw um, the video, and that's Daniel wearing the headphones in the center of the piece. Um, this is a video of him where he's learning to sing John Lennon's Imagine. And he's not a very good singer at all. And in the video, you see his voice instructors kind of cringing as he's learning. Um, but for him, it was, again, investigating those memories um, from long ago and connecting with the city of Liverpool. He also, by way of uh, humor and playfulness, included a series of monitors with a YouTube video of a sneezing panda. And this is a very simple, viral kind of phenomena that had touched many people around the world at the time that we made this. I think at the time that we made this, 60 million people had viewed this sneezing panda um, video. And he just thought this was hilarious, that you could bring together in this simple intervention the global and the local, and they would collide in kind of this obscure but funny and engaging way, which for him was the memorable manner that reflected his own original encounter with Liverpool. Curators never know what they're going to have to do with an artist when they come to you with strange ideas. Um, we ended up having to buy these soft panda bears, and on the day before the exhibition opened, um, I sent my then assistant, Denise Corseau, to the Liverpool School of Dentistry to find some false teeth because Daniel wanted his pandas to have teeth. So if you look carefully in the detail, you will see them. And apparently they were very important to him and we made it happen. Big change, a shift. <laughs> After eight years at the Blue Coat, my family and I moved to Texas. I moved back to Texas in 2014. I took on the role of director and curator at the art galleries at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. Uh, quite a different venue than the 300-year-old building I had been working in. This is a 1960s strip mall. This is one of our galleries. It looks a little nicer these days. Um, Texas Christian University is a private liberal arts college, has around 11,000 students. It's very close to the cultural district of Fort Worth that boasts the Kimball Art Museum, the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art, and the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Uh, I had previously worked at a university art gallery, and so I was excited at the prospect of returning to an academic environment and one that was in such close proximity to these world-class museums. My return to Texas was really based on the idea of considering the gallery as a classroom within the School of Art. And we have two galleries. We have Fort Worth Contemporary Arts. We also have Maudie Gallery. There was no culture of commissioning new work by artists at TCU when I arrived. None of my predecessors had done that. In fact, there was very little programming of exhibitions that involved international artists. It was very localized. And I thought about this, it didn't sit comfortably with me for the longest time, but I kept thinking about the university's mission. Our mission is to educate individuals to think and act as ethical leaders and responsible citizens in a global community. Well, that really resonated with me, particularly after all my work in Liverpool, thinking about the rich possibilities of international connections. And this, over the last few years, has really become the core of my thinking with care about student audiences. I feel that Fort Worth has a lot to offer. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the US. It's where the West begins, although I feel like this is a pretty good beginning to the West here in Colorado Springs. Uh, but that's the tagline for Fort Worth, where the West begins. It's the home of the famous stock show and rodeo. It's happening right now, and also the stockyards. So Fort Worth, for international audiences that know maybe just a little bit about American culture, they certainly know of Fort Worth, they certainly know of the American West. So the myth and reality of the American West is something I'm interested in, in exploring with some of our artists. But I had to figure out how I was going to do that, because I had to introduce some new ways of working to the galleries. And one of the first projects I did was an unusual commission, an artist residency, We'd never done that in the art galleries at TCU, a commission or a residency, and it involved the Dutch artist Sebastian Bremer. We produced Recording Studio A in 2016. Now, I had seen Bremer's work 
way back in 2008 when I was still in the UK. I had seen his work in London. It had never sort of left my mind, and I thought, if I ever have this chance, I want to connect with that artist. So I arranged to do a very simple studio visit with him at his studio in Brooklyn in 2015, and it actually was this wonderful meeting that kind of has galvanized not only a friendship now, years later still, um, but certainly this exhibition that became a 20-year retrospective and also a recording studio where a band came in and actually made a song just right in front of our eyes. Uh, so at TCU, we showed photographic works by Bremer, and you can see some of them here, suspended from the ceiling and also installed on the wall. But we also included personal photographs and other aid memoir and things that we saw in his studio that were part of his practice. And just to give you a closer example of some of his works, he works with photographs, some pre-existing imagery, some of his own imagery, but he uses white ink and paint to draw and paint very carefully. He reimagines them, these images, in this kind of pointillist style. They're really magical images. They're intense, they're obsessive, and they're really beguiling. So I was hooked, and I wanted to see more of this work. But not only that, from the conversations I was having with Bremer, I realized that actually he would be um, somebody who would be great to talk to with our students, beyond just giving an artist talk or a lecture. So here my curatorial practice about care became thinking about that audience that was going to connect with him. But then I also was really thinking about him in our conversations he told me about how lonely studio practice could be sometimes, and he had a lot of friends, and he had collaborators and people he worked with, but he really, oh gosh, he really uh, had very little connection to people in art schools or certainly to audiences to get feedback about his work. So the idea was to bring Bremer to the gallery, set up a studio, and he would work there doing an artist residency where audiences could come in, they could see the exhibition of his work, they could understand kind of a chronology of his practice, but then he was right there. They could ask him all kinds of questions about his work. So we set up this temporary space for him, and um, it was just really successful in terms of how that worked with our students. And also, it was a moment for uh, Bremer to get that feedback. And the works that you see here in the foreground are actually things that he was contemplating. New works that he wasn't sure about what he was going to do with. He'd worked a lot in black and white photography. He was slowly moving into color photography. So we created this kind of lab, almost. So you had to come in and lift up the plastic to look underneath, to kind of see what was percolating and what he was working on. So there's a little bit of audience participation, but it really was creating a studio within the gallery that had never um, happened before. I wanted to share this exhibition experience with you because I think some of the ideas and themes that you're going to see in Pleasure and Protest came out of the experience of making this particular show, Flaneurs from 2018. It's a group exhibition featuring eight international artists whose work draws attention to the role of gender in contemporary urban experience. There was a variety of media that we used, uh, that the artists used. So there's a diverse array of concerns about street life um, that is depicted in that work. There were overlapping themes in the exhibition that addressed history, memory, and social justice, but also public protest and physical movement and commodity culture. And essentially, I took a traditional idea, I took the historic idea of the 19th century European male flaneur as a point of departure, but then I wanted to engage with the ongoing scholarly debate of the appropriateness or even indeed the existence of a female equivalent, the flaneurs. And so that's what we did in this group show with eight wonderful artists. And this partly became because I had moved from the UK back to the US. I became preoccupied with not being a pedestrian, <laughs> didn't walk anywhere anymore, I was always in the car. And I wanted to think about how women move through public sp spaces and their safety in doing that and think about a gendered experience of the urban environment. So my research led me to these eight artists. And you can see here depicted in Im this image, uh, from the left, Free Our Siblings, Free Ourselves, a banner work by Tuesday Smiley. The two sculptural works are by London-based artist Alicia Paz. 
Uh, Laura Oldfield Ford has an audio piece. You see the two little yellow chairs there. And then the large photographic image you see is by Martha Cooper, who since the 1970s has been photographing the work of graffiti artists all around the world. So we wanted to place some of these works into proximity uh, to create juxtapositions. I'm realizing you're going to see that next door when you see that show. Um, and I think at that time, I realized that I saw care in my role as a curator as a form of curatorial activism at TCU. Because at the Blue Code, I had come to rely on an institutional history of curatorial practice that really recognized and supported conversations around lived experience and social justice. However, at TCU, there, there was no tradition of using the galleries as a social safe space for political discourse. So this exhibition was part of creating that space. A video by Roxanne Huilman, a dancer and choreographer dancing through the streets of Bruges. More work by Alicia Paz. And then um, Christina de Middle's photographs on the wall, which are a series of images that she shot from inside a car driving around the city of Lagos in Nigeria. We also included um, a site-specific commission by the North Texas artist Alicia Eggert. Uh, and I had conversations with her around the issue of gender on contemporary college campuses. And I should just say, too, that nearly 60% of the students on TCU's campus are women. Uh, in those conversations with Alicia Eggert, uh, her research revealed in 2018 a staggering statistic that one in, four, one in four women on college campuses in the US would experience sexual assault in their first year of college. She was shocked, I was shocked, she was galvanized to make something. So she actually made two things. <laughs> she, made a, uh, she made a pair of signs, these you are her signs. She wanted to draw attention to that statistic. Here we see one placed outside the gallery and one also placed outside the School of Art, which is on the opposite end um, of campus. Obviously, these are like stop signs, they're danger signs, they're warnings in red. But she also wanted to create a performance and something that was silent and anonymous. It was a series of pop-up performances that we did all over campus during the run of the exhibition. In many ways, this became a metaphor for many young women who remained silent and unable to talk about experiences of sexual assault. All of the performers were paid for this event. They were all, I think, yeah, they were all our students. Uh, they wore these exclamation um, signs in different parts of campus and would just stand there silently for a shift of 20 to 30 minutes. And a couple of us would be close by and we'd have some material that we would hand over to people if they were interested and they wanted to find out what was going on. But it was almost like a form of silent protest that happened um, across campus. So the final project I want to chat about very briefly, and if you came in and you had a little bit of time before the start of the lecture this evening, you will have seen a video that was a parade of cowboys of color that was part of this project by the French artist Raphael Barantini. Uh, Raphael Barantini, as I said, based in Paris, he's French, based in Paris, he uses photographic imagery on textiles to create installations that really conjure spectacle, celebration, and ritual. He works mostly creating large banners and flags. He also makes customized clothing. His work is very vibrant and using um, a lot of pattern and portraiture. He uses pre-existing imagery that he collages together, much like the work of, say, somebody like Hannah Hock or Romare Bearden. And his selection of a particular um, set of photographic portraits that you see in his work is part of his ongoing investigation of the African diaspora, of people and populations overlooked and misrepresented. His work engages with and challenges dominant iconographies of colonial interests. His work often draws attention to uh, black hero figures in French history and as such, his contemporary representation of such historic images explores issues of race and, rep and representation. So at TCU, Barantini um, created this banner for us, this huge immersive panorama that you could kind of step into. But the installation also was accompanied by an audio piece by the musician, uh, the hip hop musician, Mike Ladd. 
And this particular banner was really inspired by Barantini's research on the Haitian general Tessaint Louverture and other leaders of the Haitian Revolution. Um, and this exhibition actually engaged with a very precise historical moment within that context. It was the Battle of Vertier in 1803. And it was the fight for independence by Haitians from colonial rule of the French. Now, Barantini considered representations of equestrian portraiture within this research and thought about them as symbols of power and identity and then realized he's in Fort Worth. He's in the home of the cowboy. And so he started reflecting on the history of the American cowboy or more specifically, cowboys of color. And so this is how we also, as well as creating this banner, he created a series um, of items of clothing that cowboys would wear and then would take part in a parade through the center of our campus. So we had to find collaborators in the city and that was one of the most interesting aspects of my role in project managing um, this particular exhibition. Raphael Barantini is the young man in the khaki outfit at the center and to his right um, with the black hat is a man called Jim Austin. Now Jim Austin and his wife Gloria they founded the National Multicultural Western Heritage Museum in Fort Worth, and it's really been their life's work. They're still trying to fundraise to get a new building. But they've amassed an amazing archive. I mean, it's a very uh, local museum, and it uh, probably needs a lot of help and support in the years to come. But I was really inspired, as was uh, Barantini, of the work by Jim and Gloria and making space for black history and local stories within, um, within Fort Worth, which had been really overlooked and marginalized up to this point. So you see here Raphael with some of the cowboys, legitimate working black cowboys, um, and you can see them holding the banners that he's created, also the chaps that they're wearing, the capes and the bandanas. These were all designed by Barantini and the cowboys wore them as part of this parade. You can see one of them here suited up um, and ready to go. And if you look at the detail on his chaps, you can see some of the imagery that Barantini uses frequently. So there's African, uh, West African sculpture and statuary, but also as you see by the crossed swords referring to French colonial military rule. Um, so there's a combination of things that is happening in the details, the narratives of these objects. So we created this parade um, and the black cowboys rode through the center of campus. And at the time, I remember thinking that this was really you know, important work that we were doing to highlight and celebrate the history of the black cowboy in the West. And I was really focused on looking at it in that way for, for Barantini's project. But I realized that really there's very little diversity on our campus in our student and faculty population. The greatest diversity is within um, our staff. And I realized too that the parade would take on even greater resonance as the year 2020 wore on. So this exhibition, um, which was opened with this parade, this, the cowboys rode to the gallery and they stopped. The artists took off those items and moved them into the gallery and they then became objects of display. The exhibition opened, it was open for three days and then everything got shut down, like everything else in America, right, because of COVID. And so nobody saw the show. It was just heartbreaking after all this work. But my amazing colleague at the time, Lene Cravens, jumped into action and made sure that we had all kinds of digital materials to share with our audiences. Not only this video that Lene and our students made, although it looks very professional when you watch it, and that's kudos to them, um, but there's a sense of wanting to share what was happening in this exhibition. This was also the summer of George Floyd. And so I then started thinking about black bodies in spaces of whiteness. And so it was really important that these cowboys had the courage and the commitment and the support of the artist to come to our campus and really make this statement that was so important providing a context for our students to talk about issues of race and social justice. And there's some of the, some of the cowboys, a little bit more detail. 
from some of the items that they're wearing. And then there's the artist dressing, and on these stands, uh, specific, made custom by a local artist in Fort Worth um, for these particular items. Okay, I'm gonna be stopping in just a moment, but just to say that I'm so excited that my new project, our new project, a collective effort between my colleague Casey Digg, Lene and Joy here in Colorado Springs that we're able to bring the work of these five artists um, together. And please come to the reception tomorrow. I'd be really happy to chat with you more about this particular show. Um, I hope, I know I've run a little bit late, but I hope that, that this project and the ones that I've discussed this evening will really have revealed some threads of care that the curator um, holds, that the curator carries, and the potential that sits within the role of the curator with contemporary art. I'm very happy to answer any questions or clarify any details, um, but for now I'll just say thank you and introduce you to Crouton. He is a little, uh, one of my favorite works in our show, Pleasure and Protest, and you'll meet him tomorrow. This is the work of Keir Tanchak. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>